I want to welcome you all to the, the Cortez Branch Library. I have to remember which library I'm at. My name is Joel Banglin. I'm uh, the Branch Services Coordinator for the San Antonio Public Library. And I want to welcome you to the Cortez Branch Library. This event today is part of our African American Heritage Month celebration. And we're presenting uh, by means of a, of, uh, a video series, uh, a series called Created Equal, which is a series of documentaries that um, dealt with or recorded the civil rights movements and several different pivotal points in history in the in United States history uh, concerning the equality and civil rights um, in the United States. Um, this program is made possible by our foundation, uh, the San Antonio Public Library Foundation, and uh, they generously secured a grant for us to provide this and also provide the refreshments and the other uh, events that, that occurred in February. Uh, I want to welcome you all again and make sure that if you uh, want to know more about the subject today, please stop by a public library and make sure to get your library card. How many of you have your card already? If you're new to the library, thank you very much. If you're new to the library, make sure to get a library card. That's the best way to experience all the things that the library has to offer. Not just our programs, but also our DVDs, our books, magazines, databases and all the other things that, that the public library shares uh, and builds up on our knowledge. I hope you guys enjoy the snacks and the, and the, the, uh, the refreshments that we have today. After the, the video, we'll only show about 10 to 15 minutes of it. Um, if you'd like to borrow it, you're welcome to do so with your library card. It's a, it's a, it's a long documentary uh, and far more longer than our, the, the time that we allotted for today. So we were only going to show a few minutes of it. Um, the, the meat of this program, or the, the main point of this program, is to hear from the first-hand experiences of people who were involved in the freedom rides across the United States. Um, this particular video is called Freedom Riders, and we are fortunate enough to have a participant in that demonstration actually live here in San Antonio, and she'll be speaking today, and um, a person whose brother was a uh, writer also, and, and she's going to tell us about her family's experience with, with his being incarcerated just for riding a bus. Now you might think, why is it so important that we talk about people riding on a bus? This is also different from the event of the Montgomery bus boycott. This was a, a demonstration across the South um, that challenged the laws of travel and interstate travel. So it was illegal for African-American people to get on a bus and go to, to the state of Florida uh, if they were coming from Texas, for instance. Um, they had to ride a separate bus, and sometimes there weren't even those buses in existence or those routes in existence. Um, so you can imagine, we have the convenience of being able to travel wherever we want to today, but imagine if you had to be restricted uh, to whatever state you lived in because there were no buses that you could ride to get on to to, to another state. Um, I hope this helps you think and helps you think about, uh, helps you understand that experience. And please share what you, uh, what you think about our program through our event survey at the end of the program. So I'll go ahead and start some of the video. Again, we're going to show only 15 minutes of it. So enjoy the snacks. You're welcome to keep on getting more snacks while the video is going, and then we'll have our speakers come up to the front. I'm going to go ahead and pause it right there uh, uh, so that we have enough time for our speakers to speak and, and have our, our panel discussion. This movie is available in the San Antonio Public Library, and you can borrow it with your library card. It is about a two and a half hour documentary and uh, we have several copies available to, for a check out. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Luana Gray. Would you come on up? Come on up? She's a historian. Did I say your name right? Mm -hmm. Luana Gray, a historian who specializes in the study of African American women's lives and labors. She is an assistant professor with a joint appointment in history in the history department and the Honors College of UTSA. There, in addition to U.S. history courses, she teaches seminars on the construction of race and gender and coordinates the American Studies program. Her first book, We Just Keep Running the Line, Black Women and the South Arkansas Poultry Industry, 
is scheduled for publication in the fall of 2014 by the LSU Press. I'd like to call up our, our one of our speakers, Patricia Dilworth, is a veteran of the Freedom Riders campaign to integrate public transportation through the South in 1961. She was not even 20 when she left her home in Tucson, Arizona to participate in the historic fight for justice. Only after she had hit the road did she tell her mother and her intention to join the Freedom Rides. Her role in the Freedom Rides of 1961 earned her 39, a 39-day sentence in Parchment, in Parch, Parchment Penitentiary. After her release, she participated in an impromptu sit-in when denied service at a segregated eatery. She is a graduate of the Licensed Vocational Nurse Program at San Diego Mesa Cal College in San Diego, California, and she went on to earn the Associates of Arts degree at Lassen College in Herlong, California. Shortly after, she joined the military. Dilworth is a veteran of Operation Desert Storm, and she retired from the U.S. Army after a career that spanned nearly 25 years. She was awarded the highest peacetime commendation, the Legion of Merit, and she resides in San Antonio. Barbara Collins Bowie, Ms. Bowie, is, an, is the ex executive director of the J.R. Bowie III Scholarship Foundation. She was born in Jackson, Mississippi, a city universally regarded as a hotbed of, of the battle of racial equality. Ms. Bowie was a teen in 1963 when civil rights leader Edgar Med Medgar Evers, excuse me, was assassinated not far from where she lived. Two years prior, she was stunned when her older brother, Jesse James Davis, was pulled off a bus, beaten by a mob, and sent to the notorious Parchman Penitentiary for his participation in the Freedom Rides of 1961. She followed in his footsteps, demonstrating in, uh, participating in demonstrations across Jackson. For most of her life, she has uh, been committed to helping others, first as a licensed vocational nurse and later as a social worker. She is a graduate of Our Lady of the Lake University, and her passion has been, ad for, has been advocating for mentally handicapped individuals. She has operated and has a share in establishing assisted living and adult daycare facilities in Alamo City. Thank you and welcome for sharing. Uh, uh, welcome to the, the, the Cortez Branch Library, and we anticipate your, your story. Now, Ms. Dilworth, I understand you. Ms. Dilworth, I understand we had a clip of your, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Bowie, we had a clip of your brother yeah. um, that we would like to share before you speak. Is, is it queued up yet? We're going to show this just real quick. This is, uh, this was an interview from, the, is it the interview from the Express? Yes. citizenship things just didn't work with me. And I would get into a lot of trouble because of that, you know. And when I graduated from um, high school, I heard about the Freedom Rides. Never thinking that they would arrive in Jackson because uh, they were scheduled to go from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. So I thought they would just pass through Jackson. And I said, oh my God, this is something that I want to participate in. And this is a vehicle perhaps to get me to where I want to go, you know, in terms of, you know, changing the, the Jim Crow status policies. I went to a, way, a mass meeting and I heard um, two uh, core workers speak about freedom rights. And they said, well, you know, this is a way to change the policies in Mississippi. And I said, well, I'm in, you know. So I agreed to go down and try to integrate the white bus station and trailway bus station in Jackson, Mississippi. When I walked into that station, there was no fear. There was a lot of anticipation because I didn't know what was going to happen, but I didn't have any fear because I felt this was my opportunity to strike back at Jim Crow. So I felt pretty good about that. And I knew beforehand that uh, I was going to have to spend 39 days in prison. Once I was arrested, it felt liberating. Like, uh, the chains had fell off of my back and my feet, and you know, I felt like 
I feel like a first class citizen for once in my life. So we were there for what, uh, 39 days, and, um, and there were all kinds of incidents. You know, we would sing, you know, to keep our spirits up. We would sing freedom songs. Uh, they would get angry sometimes. The second in command was a guy named, a uh, short uh, white guy named Sergeant Sturry. And Sergeant Sturry would come down quite often and say, you goddamn nigger freedom riders, stop that singing. There ain't no freedom here. One, one night we were singing. And Sergeant Sturry, each day he was getting angrier and angrier and angrier, and this was building up. This night it exploded. He said, open up the cell blocks and bring, bring them damn niggas and, and those white agitators out of here. And they put us in something called a box. It's solitary confinement. It was adequate enough to house maybe two inmates. They put approximately 12 of us in there, just shoved us in there, and they cut off the ventilation. For the first time, I feel that I was going to lose my life because I couldn't breathe, and the air that I was breathing in was so hot. So sudden story came down. Uh, we said, hey, someone has passed out. We are dying in here. Sergeant Story came down and said, niggas, I'll let you out, but you're going to have to say, yes, sir. And he said, all together, on the count of three, one, two, three, you know what we said, yes, sir. <laughs> what I think most people overlook is that uh, I lived in Jackson at that time, and the Jackson Freedom Riders, the other Freedom Riders came from other points, uh, other states. So when they left prison, they got on airplanes or buses and left town. Jackson Freedom Riders had to stay there. When I walk around my neighborhood, there was two cops known to be brutal to black folks. They would drive up, and if I was around, uh, they would slowly walk, slowly car down, to keep pace with my steps. And they would say, Jesse James Davis, the Freedom Rider. Man, what is this freedom shit about, you know? I never answered them, and they never went any further than they never tried to physically attack me. But they would let me know, you know, well, we know where you live, and, you know, and we keep an eye on you. Anything can happen any day. They never verbally expressed those things, but, you know, that's what was implied. begin by asking a few questions of you and then we'll open it up to the audience and I want to say again how much of an honor it is for me to be here this is something that I get to teach about it's very central to my teaching um, the civil rights movement and to actually be with people and to talk to people and hear your experiences for people who've um, been through it and, and been so important in it it's an immeasurable honor and so we're, I'm so glad for your sacrifices and so appreciative because of course had it not been for the work of people like you, I would not be where I am. So I know that, especially as a rural Southerner myself. Right? Um, so, Ms. Dilworth, I wanted to ask you first, I was listening to your story. I actually have a, like a two-pronged question. Uh, and we saw a lot in the video that people who come from other places, mm -hmm. so-called other places, are often accused of being outside agitators. And that was always Southerners' excuse, that our Negroes here are happy, it's just these outside agitators come in and get them all riled up and they cause the problems or whatever. And you were coming from Arizona. So I wanted to ask you first what you thought about or, or how you kind of challenged this idea of that you were an outside agitator, like why it was so important to you. And I also wanted to ask you about what made you go? Like, especially as such a, you know, from reading your story, such a young woman, not even 20. I'm someone who mothers teenagers and teaches teenagers and people that age every day. And there's such a sense of apathy. I can't imagine anything motivating them like that. So what made you go? And how did you deal with, you know, this idea that you were an outside um, agitator? How did you challenge that kind of idea? Well, the reason I went was where I lived in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we were in the minority, but when I was being brought up 
we had no signs or nothing like that. And I saw that bus, do you remember the bus that was burning? And that started me thinking, why, why, why do they hate people so much just because they happen to be brown? I, that's the first thing that I couldn't understand. I had just turned 18 because I, in June, and I was arrested uh, July 7th. I didn't consider myself an outside agitator. I went because I could not understand, and to this day I still don't understand it, why the color of somebody's skin made such a difference in how you're treated didn't make any sense to me. So I went without my parents' permission. <laughs> and I called eventually, you know, to let them know I was okay because I'd been gone a few days. And um, she said, well, where are you? I said, well, <laughs> I'm in New Orleans. <laughs> Why are you in New Orleans? I said, well, Mom, remember that bus? What bus? And I told her about the Greyhound bus. I said, well, I had to go because it didn't make sense to me. And I had to see for myself why. And why would they hate me? And I don't even live there, you know? I don't have problems like that. So as far as being an outside, I didn't feel that. I didn't think I was an outsider. I just felt I was going down for a selfish reason initially. Okay. And did your, did, while you were there, did your reasoning change? Like a lot of them seemed like they started out very naive, like thinking, we're not going to need this training. It can't get that bad. So I think maybe a lot of people go, especially because they're young, you think that nothing can happen to you. Right. But once you, I mean, you see this bus being firebombed and you're, right. getting, and you're getting beaten or whatever, does that change how you feel or your purpose for being there? Uh... No, I don't think. Well, yes, it did change. I mean, I knew after the bus and after I had gotten there and the look that these that they they looked at you like like they could just come and just kill you just like that and I'm saying these people don't even know me. Then I got scared. I got really nervous when they took us to Parchment Prison um, because the cells are small. I'm not quite sure how small it was, but I knew it was only for two people, and there were four of us in there with two bunks. So, you know, he had put, two of us slept in the same bed, not, <laughs> you know, I slept with somebody's foot and so forth. So then I began to get nervous, and towards the end I got sick, um, and they thought I had appendicitis, and there was no way <laughs> they were going to operate on me down there. <laughs> there was no way. So um, <laughs> I, I got out, and it ended up being gastroenteritis, so it wasn't a big deal, but there was no way they were going to do that to me down there. <laughs> no. Thank you. Miss um, Bowie, so whereas Miss Dilworth was coming from Arizona, you were a native of Mississippi. And I think that creates a different experience because even for someone like me, we see in the film that, you know, Birmingham, they, call, they describe Birmingham in the film as like the seat or center of like this r racial violence, like, you know, the, the climax sort of racial violence. And we know that Birmingham also had the nickname Bombingham because black people's houses and businesses and stuff got bombed so much. So Birmingham and Alabama is pretty dangerous. I'm from rural Louisiana where things are pretty dangerous and bad, but there's this story around Mississippi that Mississippi is like the most Southern of all of them. That, you know, it's, it's if any place exemplifies where it's maybe the worst, even though it's bad everywhere, it's like Mississippi. Like even when I was growing up, my parents would tell me from rural Louisiana, don't get caught in Mississippi at night, you know? <laughs> so, I guess in a sense I have that same kind of question. Given that you come up in that context where there's so much pressure and so much oppression, and I think because Mississippi has 
such a large black population, not the majority, but a large black population, the white people there feel like they have to like really be, you know, forceful because something could happen that, because of the sheer numbers. How do you make the decision in that kind of atmosphere, in this place where it's storied to be the most oppressive place of all, how do you make the choice that you, you know, you're going to go become an activist, that you're going to fight this Jim Crow system and try to make things better? Let because I'm thinking it has to be a lot of fear and you know warnings and threats, or like what your brother was saying, like the cops and knowing things that could happen to you. So it was not a choice. Okay. This was our way of life, and I remember uh, Ross Barnett, our governor, said at one time, "Our Mississippi Mississippi Negroes are content." And I want to say to you that for a time we were because there was nothing we could do except uh, just accept what was going on and some of the things that you saw uh, was going on and we lived it. So when this movement started and I know that my brother was, was really happy because he uh, was going against it, you know, all of our lives. And uh, he was an activist uh, even in before this started. And so when this movement started, we all became a part of it because this was what we needed to do to uh, make things better for ourselves. And so even though he was older, and he was traveling with the Freedom Riders and going places. Uh, I was still having problems there because we would walk out of school and we would go, you know, when they would uh, do things at the courthouse, students would walk out and go down to the courthouse and do sit-ins. I remember um, several incidents uh, that we got involved in, you know, because we were protesting as well. And I want to say, you know, um, there was like restaurants where, you know, the colored, as they called us at that time, had this particular side and the whites were over here. And that was one in our, our neighborhood. And on the white side, you know, the tables were with table, white tablecloths and uh, the people were being served with, um, by waitresses or whatever. There was a wall, and there was a window, and uh, this side had a few booths and a jukebox and a counter, and the I'm saying color, okay? But the black kids could come in there, and uh, all we could do was order hamburgers or French and French fries or something like that, and we could put money in the in the jukebox and dance. But we would have to go to the window and ring a bell for service and so that type of thing when this movement started you know um, it was just automatic for us to get involved and I remember uh, some of the you know my classmates we uh, finally went on the white side and you know we sat at the counter went in there and sat at the counter and uh, we were asking for service and um, you know, at first they just ignored us. Now we knew it was dangerous. You know, we knew they could do anything to us because none of the officials would do anything when the blacks were being beaten or abused. Mm -hmm. But even as kids, you know, we felt we had to do this. So we went in there and uh, we were demanding service. Well, we weren't demanding it, we were just asking. <laughs> <laughs> We couldn't really demand. But, uh, you know, they ignored us, but we were very young. So they knew not to really, you know, hurt us, but they, you know, insisted, you know, physically that we leave and go to the other side. And so, you know, there were several incidents like that that I could talk about that you know where we were involved but it wasn't a choice this is this was our lives
Uh, I think you're both very humble about your bravery. Both of you have said, you said you had to go. You told your mom and you had to go. Mm -hmm. And you're saying for you, it wasn't a choice. You had to do it. So I, I think in, in saying that, really, it, you're really humble about how brave you were or, or your, you know, your feeling for going. Because there were a lot of people who didn't feel like they had to or who may have felt like they had to, who didn't have the courage or who had so a lot, felt like they had too much to lose or whatever. So again, I'm just really honored that you're sharing your stories and, and just really see such bravery in your um, stories. I wanted to ask you about, um, both of you speak kind of, of of being concerned for a collective good about other people. And um, before, we, before the panel, we talked about how your the people that you didn't even really know on the bus who felt, you know, in invested in you and invested in things being right, refused to eat because you couldn't be served, just to give a short example of that story. And um, for people to go through things like this, to ride on a bus together, to sit together and demand, well, ask for service, <laughs> <laughs> to, um, to go to prison together, to a place like Parchman, which has a horrible history, particularly for African Americans, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. back into the 19th century. Um, what kinds of things create that bond, or, or uh, and it seems like sometimes it's almost instantaneous. What makes you made you feel connected to these people and to have that kind of trust that they're not going to run off and leave you by yourself? You know, there had to be a lot of trust, and I think to a certain extent, a kind of love among activists to be able to do that kind of work. So, what did you feel made that bond strong, or, or how did it grow? I think. For me, is that um, we all had the same goal in mind. We we were we had one thing that we all wanted to do, whether you were black or you were white. We wanted to go down. We wanted to test the system, and it was strong. It, it was I don't know how to put it. It was just strong and you could say anything to them you could tr tr you just trusted one another to make sure that nobody was going to be left behind if one went we were all going to go we were just all and it wasn't something that was said it was just something that was understood mm -hmm. and I, I think that uh we all crave that equality. And I think we still do. I mean, we're still, you know, today fighting for equality. Uh, you know, we've made progress, but there's a unity in that. And uh, even in the difference in our ages, and uh, I'd like to say that uh, that bus was 50% white. So, you know, uh, there are others and Hispanics, you know, who want that equality. And I think that, you know, that's our right, our human right. And I feel that we're willing to do just about anything to have that. So, you know, and I, I think that you guys would feel that way too, you know, uh, because of the, the fact that things are not equal. So my next question, and then I'll open it to the audience and we can come back if, if we have time. Um, th we didn't see the whole film, but the story of the Freedom Rides, if you don't know, is that even after being beaten and bombed and some people hospitalized, and the fact that in reality they never make, the plan is to go from the Upper South in D.C. through the Deep South to New Orleans, right? They're, they're never on those buses going to make it to New Orleans. But even as people are arrested, you know, that this is a, a lighter policy, rather than beating them, then they start, you know, there's negotiations with Robert Kennedy, and they start throwing them in jail, which is pretty bad in and of itself. But um, they arrest them, and they arrest them in all kinds of places, and young people keep coming. They mm -hmm. won't stop, right? There's no turning back. So finally what happens is that the Interstate Commerce Commission has to step in and say, okay, there's already been these two Supreme Court decisions, the one in 1946, the Boynton versus Virginia decision in 1960. Um, so we're going to step in and we're going to give these, at, you know, these decisions some teeth. That's what's going to, you know, stop, you know, stop a lot of the segregation on interstate travel. 
but these people the the young people wouldn't stop and even for you as an activist and i think looking at your life stories like how successful you've been and the work that you've done since then and you're still your focus on equality and you know achieving or whatever what is that spirit that motivates you like why is there this feeling because a lot of people get discouraged i mean you saw mega evers be killed you saw you know even in the height of the movement you see people like malcolm x or martin luther king be killed um you see in you know a couple of years later you see those little girls in alabama be killed what motivates that spirit where i'm not going to turn back like why, why do you keep you know how do you is the name of the famous film how do you keep your eyes on the prize like how do you do that because i want to be free I want to be able to go any place I want to go, regardless of my color. And I feel that if you set your standards here, you can make it. Because being in the military for 24 years, not only was I facing prejudice because of being black, but I also was a black female, okay, which made what I had to do in the military things, not anything wrong, but when I went to NCO courses in the Army, I always, always, always was in the top 20% of all three of my classes, always because I had to show the men that I'm as good as you are. I wore a marksmanship, excellent marksmanship on my chest. I can shoot an M16 as good as you can. I can take it apart, clean it as good as you can, okay? And you're not gonna stand in my way because if you do, I'm gonna run over you. <laughs> so you get out of my way and when I came in, because you don't understand, uh, you may not know much about the Army, but you have E139, and I told them uh, when I was being interviewed for uh, a leadership uh, award out of basic training, they asked me what I planned to do in the military, and I told them when I got out, I was going to be a sergeant major. And that's exactly what I did. Wow. <laughs> so I knew then that I was born places. And so that's, I just want to be free. And I want you to be free. I want everybody to be able to do whatever it is that they want to do. They need to be able to do it. Well, I became an activist very young. Um, and sitting out there is my daughter and my grandson and one of the students from the Bowie Foundation after school program. Um, my motivation is that I want my grandson, I've always wanted kids of, I don't know why they call us of different color or whatever, but I want any of our kids to be able to say, I want to be president, and that possibility is there. I have been working with kids most of my life and trying to help them find ways to, um, to get over some of the anger, uh, find ways uh, of uh, find th ways to use things to use to get them through some of the hardships because our kids the minority kids have a hard time because they don't they can't aspire to be all that the white kids can aspire to be so I have worked with them and I want so much for them to be able to aspire to be anything they want, want to be. When I was um, in, uh, from elementary school through high school, when I graduated, I got my transcript one time and read, really read it. And every year they would ask us, 
you know, what do you want to be? Well, I would always say a nurse because um, the only thing we could aspire to be was either a nurse, a teacher, or a secretary. You know what I'm saying? And so um, that is too limiting for us. I'm motivated to help these kids learn and do the things that they need to do to aspire to be whatever they want to be or whatever anyone else would want to be. And so that has kept me, you know, kind of working with the kids and um, uh, motivated to, and when we get to a point where we have a black president, you know, I want everybody to feel like, hey, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, look, you can be that president. And I know I, my grandson, I was working on him since he was, bo when, since he came out, you know, mm -hmm. Harvard University, because that's where most of the presidents <laughs> <laughs> and at one time he was saying he wanted to be president because that was, you know, my dream that not that he would become that, but he could say, you know, because we couldn't even say it yeah. when, you know, so. Okay. Good. All right. So I wanted to see if anyone in the audience had any questions they want to ask of our distinguished panelists. So because um, when you go through, just to give you an example of some of the things that happened when we were in this prison, I don't know if you remember, they showed very briefly those cells and then those windows, remember the windows on the building that were like, I think like these here? That's all we saw while we were in there. We only got out of the cell one time a week, and that was to take a shower. And the rest of the time we were in our cells. Very uh, confining. confining, very mm -hmm. structured. And for me, in order to do that, you have to not let them get in your mind. You need to get in their mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the freedom, being a freedom writer, gave me the courage, I think, to, to, in fact, I know that I could do anything that I really set my mind to, because 39 days is a long time to be in a small cell with four other people, or with three other people. And that was death row. I don't yeah. think we named it, but yeah. <laughs> and it was. was. It, it, I mean, the the just the sound of those doors. You know, I can hear them opening and and closing and clanging and all that type of stuff. And to know that you aren't free to do what you want to do, that's uh, humbling. Yes. Did you ever sing in the jail cell? Did I what? Ever sing in the jail? Oh yeah. We sung all the time. <laughs> I mean we were like on radio. <laughs> yeah. Uh we used to have these uh contests uh among the cells and we all pick out a song now. I am the worst singer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh we we sung 
in the steel of the night by James Brown. Oh, wow. <laughs> One of my yeah. favorites. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we sung a lot. We sung, and it helped. We we make up songs and all kind of stuff. So yes. That's a good question coming from a young person, especially because one of the things that I do teach about in my civil rights class is the importance of singing and um, songs. So um, just to interject and then we'll go back to the audience. Can you tell them a little bit why about like why the songs were so important? What like how they made you feel or what kind of messages they got across? Why do you think music was so important to the civil rights movement? <laughs> what else were you going to do? <laughs> you had no paper, so you couldn't write nothing, <laughs> you know. Um, you ate three times a, a day, and I don't know, they must have got cooks from, uh, I don't know where they got their cooks from, but the food was horrible. <laughs> you know, you're, you're hungry <laughs> for 39 days, you get this goop that they used to make uh, for breakfast stuff called cornmeal mush. Mm -hmm. I never had nothing <laughs> like that, corn and all it water. was was cornmeal and with water is what it with <laughs> eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. Cornbread would have so much pepper oh, in it, oh, cool. like you didn't even need to season nothing because they had already seasoned it for you, you know. So the only thing you just had to do what you had to do and that's why I think singing and, and we make up songs you know the past kind of message along you kind of get this little because you can reach the next cell with stuff you know and you go to the bathroom when you had your one shower and um, <clears throat> we used to have a parade as you walk uh, to the shower with your towel and you know, anything to, to to just make us laugh and not be so depressed, because I wasn't depressed when I was in there. I mean, we had good conversations. Good. And not coming from the South, but from Arizona, did you know the Freedom Songs when you got there? Did you have to learn them? And did they encourage you and inspire you up? Anne Hooley, in her book, Coming of Age in Mississippi, which is a library that was circulating, talks about how when she writes from a woman's experience, you've been in, in this jail, or you're in the paddy wagon, and what do you do to pass time? Like you said, you know, so they would motivate themselves by singing these freedom songs. Mm -hmm. Did you, did, how, how did those songs affect you? <coughs> did, so I'd like to expand on this general little, little, little fella, fella's question here. How did you, how did those songs make you? Uh, you know, they were ha they were happy songs. You know, we didn't sing sad stuff. We sung happy songs. And if you go to church, uh, you know how you're in the choir, and then you have the main singer, and then you have your uh, mm -hmm. background yes. singers. You know, that's how we taught each other songs because one person would start leading, you know, and then we just repeat what basically what they had sung and then they put some words and then we <laughs> we were like the background uh singers to a group and i know that um uh, my brother would talk about uh he talked a lot about the songs and he said that you know of course they were being treated so brutally that you know the songs were something that kept them going and I guess it was you know kind of a motivating mm -hmm. uh, fact and that was the only thing they could do that was the only thing that they had you know that couldn't be taken away right. from them right. and so you know with him talking about the uh, the guy at the, the jail or I mean he was very angry that they kept singing and singing and singing because it was showing something that they didn't want, you know, it was showing that they were in jail, but we can be happy, we can sing, we can be together, we can do, and uh, the whites didn't like that. Mm -hmm. They never liked the songs, so <laughs> that was and something. And I mean, we could sing. Sometimes you'd be so hoarse from singing, you know, and, and we sung a lot. 
a lot. Mm-hmm. It seems like the singing was, from what I've seen and studied, like a big um, sort of morale booster in mm-hmm. a way. Like in your Motivator. lowest, yes, ma'am, in your lowest points. Like my favorite historical figure is Fannie Lou Hamer, and I love her oh. for a number of reasons. You know, she's Southern and rural, and from the same agricultural background as mm-hmm. my grandparents. But you know, then the fact that she had the nerve, even after she's been, you know, kicked out of her farm where she'd been sharecropping and beating and all these things, and you know, she'd go with these young people, and she was like you said, determined to be free. And you know, they would look so down at some points, and then she'd just break out in song, mm-hmm. and it's like their whole mood would turn mm-hmm. around. And she has such a strong, beautiful voice, and their whole mm-hmm. moods would turn around. And so I think it's just yeah. so important. Which is, I'm really glad you asked that question. So music is so important, and it's part of this movement. Oh yeah. I had two comments. Um, the first was thinking about this young man's question. <laughs> um, and, and thinking about the songs, for me, it just, well, of course, it doesn't take me back, but it makes me think of um, slavery and slaves picking cotton. Yeah. And as they're, yes, they're yeah. singing these mm-hmm. Negro spirituals, yeah, right. their masters are beating them, but they're still singing these songs that are either sending messages or lifting their strength. Exactly. Whether it's wait in the water or not going to let nobody turn me around, those songs still empowered you. And of course, it angered the jailer because it's like I can't break these ends. <laughs> you know, no matter right. what I do, that's they right. keep on and singing, and I can't break them mentally. Um, but yeah. it, it, for me, it just is, was a source of that. And then my other comment is looking at whether it's freedom writing, sit-ins. It seemed more like a children's protest because, of course, the parents can't protest because they're the economic breadwinners. So they'll either lose their jobs or lose their livelihoods. But it's so many children, um, it's like my parents would always tell me, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Mm-hmm. And, and as children, as youth, you guys stood for something that you couldn't necessarily change the laws by yourself because, of course, you weren't voting. But you knew you had to stand for something. But then I look at, unfortunately, our youth of today who, for many reasons, seem not to stand for anything or just the wrong things. Um, and if so many of them had parents and grandparents that directly connected them to uh, this history, they would say, well, how can I be in a gang? How can I not vote? How can I not want to go to school if this is what, you know, my ancestors, whether they're black, Latino, white, this is what my ancestors did for me, but I have the nerve to not aspire to do better. Um, So those are the things that just, you know, come to my mind. And I, I want to make a comment about that uh, in regard to parents, because um, when the Freedom Riders were arrested and uh, they were uh, treated so badly, I was out there, you know, with parents who, you know, our parents really did not want us to get involved in this. And that was because uh, of two things, I believe. One is that they had come from a slavery time when it was so bad, you know. And now, just like Ross Barnett, the, the governor was saying, there's, there was a contentment because the, it was a little bit better. And also because they knew that this was dangerous because prior to that, you know, of course, blacks were being killed and there was nothing anybody could do you could walk and and see your your brother or your mother or what hanging and you you couldn't say anything you couldn't do anything you know and so i'm thinking that they didn't want us involved because of the fear that we were going to be hurt and of course there was houses being bombed and and all kinds of things going on around us or you know and like I said, when Medgar Evers was uh, killed, we all ran up there, you know, without fear. You know, we're running up there, but they there could have been a mob there waiting to just shoot, you know, or whatever, all of us. But um, uh, our parents really, although they supported some of the things we did, really did not want us uh, involved. And I remember my mother was really just kind of really fearful because she didn't know what was going on. And my mother was a maid at that time for uh, Millsaps College. And, um, but what happened and what she found out is that every time a Freedom Rider was arrested or whatever, their names would be 
um, in the news the next day. But what happened is that they would put their name, their address, their age, their school, you know, all of this information in there. So when my brother was talking about the police saying to him, you know, nigga, we know where you live, you know, that was very scary, you know, because we knew what the possibility was. And so um, I think it was a, a, um, a really hard time for the parents, you know, wanting this to happen, but not wanting something to happen to, to the kid, kids. I just have a question for my own mother. And I never asked you, because you know what happened in Compel when I was a teenager. <laughs> and, and just in a nutshell, I experienced the, the racism as a group of us uh, black students that experienced it. It was really blatant, and it was the teachers, not even the students. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother uh, and those parents stepped in and put that out in the public, and it was on the, uh, on the radio, and this was in the Dallas area in Coppell, Texas. Um, and I never asked you, you know, I didn't really, uh, even at that age as a teenager, I didn't really know what you went through uh, you know, until, you know, growing older and actually paying attention. So I'm wondering what you could have possibly thought when you saw, you know, your daughter experiencing something that you experienced. And this is, you know, in 92, you know, something so recent, a time that's so recent to go through almost what you went through. I'm wondering what could have possibly went through your mind. And I never really asked you that. You know, uh, and I'm glad you asked that because um, there, at that time, there was a lot of frustration. Today, I feel frustration because we have fought battles back in the 60s, in the 40s, and, you know, we have fought battles that we continue fighting today. And it's so frustrating that we keep going over and over and over, and people are saying, oh, we're much better, this is happening, but, you know, uh, racism is, you know, we're afraid to call racism racism today. And so it's very frustrating, you know, because I was fighting for you. I was sacrificing for you and my grandson and, and the kids that I work with. And to see us go continue to go through this is, is, is extremely humiliating and, and, and very frustrating. And at that particular time in Coppell, that was, that was frustrating, and, uh, uh, but in a sense motivating as well, because I knew that I needed to keep fighting and keep uh, teaching the kids and keep, you know, keep them in, in, the, in the knowledge of what has happened. Um, for Martin Luther King, we brought, you know, four uh, Freedom Riders for panel discussions. And we went from, we went to, um, we went to Judson ISD and we went to two of the schools there and another um, school, uh, private school, Keystone. And I'm telling you, those kids were so in awe of the panel, the stories. And this is something that we need to continue doing. We need to keep the history alive so that these kids can have something they can hold on to, so that they know that there is a foundation here, so that they know that there's something that we need to continue fighting for because it's only a little bit better, you know? Yeah. But it's still a struggle. And so that's, that frustration is still there for me. I keep reading the book, and I already mentioned the name, Coming of Age in Mississippi, because I was interested in, I was always interested in the civil rights movement. I would do, my research papers would always be centered on it because I could not learn enough. And Moody talks about the summer of 1963. It was the summer before voting, was either Black Pass and Voting Rights Act. They were trying to they were trying to register people for voting. That was when our next big wave of violence mm -hmm. uh, 
Tell you about it, 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 in Mississippi, it's, well, I'm sorry, but it, it's always Mississippi. I'm from Bad, but it wasn't as bad as Mississippi or Birmingham, I'm happy to say. But do you remember the pressure ramping up of the, the climate, ramping up again as we, we were approaching my historic 1964? Because this is a last ditch effort. The vote is the vote is at stake for the African American. They're going in trying to sign people up. Some people are so poor. And the literally like said they didn't even know what voting was. She said they didn't vote. What's that? And these yes. the college is coming up for little. Well, yes. We, you know, we don't want to rush you to vote. Freedom Summer was what was was, was, was going to be the next year. Did you? What was the climate that you noticed? And Moody talked about it being stressful. Very stressful. It, uh, 63, 64, 65. I graduated in '65, and um, that next year was when the schools were actually integrated and kids were being bused, you know. Um, I have uh, classmates who were involved in that, but I'm telling you, I was so glad that I missed that, you know. Uh, and, and there's a real good reason, I don't know if we have time for it, but you know, the teachers, are, you know, we were in black schools and our teachers really, really fought to teach us because we didn't have the, the, the materials, we didn't have the right, you know, the things that we needed. So they went through everything they could creatively come up with so that we would learn. And during that time, it never got better, DL. It didn't uh, get better during those years. Uh, it continued and it was so stressful for everybody because the movement had started and there was no turning back. And so we continued the fight. And I remember uh, my mother, you know, she was a maid for Millsaps College, but she was also a maid for one of the professors there. And um, I never rode the city, but cause we, we, as kids, we walked everywhere, you know. But one day, well, there was one city bus that was used sort of like a school bus in the black area and it would take us to Jackson State University from anywhere you know and I used to ride that bus and when I would get on it you know I would sit in the first seat because that's you know and that was okay so my mother asked me to go with her to clean this professor's house one day the only day the only time she ever asked me that and um, we had to ride the bus and so when I went, you know, there were other maids, you know, I know you've seen help. I, I'm, I'm real familiar with that. But anyway, the other maids were standing out there and we were all waiting for the bus. So I got on first, of course, and my mother came to pay. So when I got on, I did what I had done on the other bus. I just sat down in that first long seat. Well, you know. <laughs> need to get up. Huh? <laughs> okay, ask me what happened. Because, you know, what I'm happened? in the mood. I'm, <laughs> I'm in the movement, okay? So my mother and the other maids got on because, of course, they went all the way to the back. And my mother was calling me, gal, gal, come, come. You know, she was going like that. Come on back here. I didn't move. Now, in front of me was two whites, a white gentleman, I hesitate to call him that, but anyway, and a young lady, and then on the other side of me was a white person. This guy <laughs> got up and started calling me. Nigger was not even bad, but he was calling me names that I, you know, that were really, really terrible. And so the black women in the black in the back, they were getting their umbrellas ready because they used to carry them, you know. They because you know if he had touched me, they were gonna beat his butt. I'm sure of that. But anyway, he got down on the step of the um, of the bus, like to get off at the next exit, and uh, you know he continued just just 
verbally abusing me so bad. But my inclination was to sit there, okay? Although my mom and all the other blacks wanted me to come in the back. So it was a very frustrating time, you know, during those times because you were kind of in between, you know, what do you do? I mean, we're fighting for these rights, but we're not getting them, you know? So we have to continue fighting. And that's what happened. We just continued, you know, trying to make it better. I have a question. So I'm from New York, total different experience. Oh, yeah. I was born in the 70s, so again, very different experience. Um, you being from Mississippi, you being from Arizona, my, I wonder what was the racial climate like here in San Antonio? For during that time, I mean, I don't, YouTube wouldn't know, mm -hmm. but if there's anyone here that would know, um, you have freedom riding going on, you have, you know, Brown versus the Board of Ed, all these things are happening in the South, but here we are in the Southwest, there's still segregation, mm -hmm. but what was it like between blacks, Latinos, and whites here during that time? By the, during this period, <coughs> from a little bit, I know just from teaching um, at and UTSA so long and having students be interested, um, there are, you know, very much issues, even though San Antonio is one of those cities that tries to desegregate quietly, right? You know, they're, they're, um, so there might not be the violence that you see in other areas, but there are still very much systemic issues. Like I'll have people tell me, you know, if you were on the west side or the east side in some places, it was like being in, in, in this is their language, a third world country because of the lack of paved roads and the lack of, you know, what, um, running water, you know, still having outhouses and stuff. So those kinds of effects where even where there might not be these Jim Crow laws anymore, and get, don't get me wrong, there have been, um, particularly for Latinos in the area, you know, all these kinds of ways that you can segregate their children. Like you'll say, um, you'll assume that every child who is, you know, Latino uses Spanish as the first language. Well, they can't possibly need, you know, English training, so they will put them um, they have to do the first two years of school in separate classes, and then we'll make them do the first two years for four years, right? So they get behind mm -hmm. their white counterparts or whatever. So even though you know Latinos are um, by law white, they're definitely not treated like white people, right? But I mean, there's still issues. Like even when I came here to get the job at UTSA, because there are things that I wanted to get in you know black communities and you know hair care and all those kinds of things, where they were very careful at my job to tell me, well, you know the east side of town is the historically black side of town you know they're very and it, you know so and there had been lots of debate about where my school was built that this is supposed to be a school that's serving the community at large but it's built up there on the northwest side where there aren't many black and brown people and that caused a lot of conflict so there are very much you know those kinds of racial even with the absence of you know these hard deep south jim crow laws you can very much see in the way that people are educated tracked into certain education their living conditions or whatever you can very much see that there are race issues um, uh, within San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. In many parts of Texas where there are Latinos or other cultures represented, um, they each all have to deal with their own racism too. Mm -hmm. So don't give, the, don't give anyone the excuse that just because you're another minority group that you're not racist. Some people forget that the advancement that the African American community made, that we are actually beneficiaries of that also. Because yes. at any moment, the white community could make us out to be the word color. Mm -hmm. And it, that actually happened in many of our schools here in Texas where, okay, so we'll desegregate. So we'll put you with these white students who are really Latino with the black students. Because <laughs> now you're desegregated. Right, right. And yeah. you still get poor, poor city services or mm -hmm. poor education exactly. services. Exactly. Yeah. But you're desegregated. Yeah. So it, it, there was actually a movement in early 70s in Texas, and Houston was part of it. I, I know that from Houston. I'm a, a nearly native Houstonian. And I think it was it followed San Antonio's movement where these Latino students moved, stepped out of classrooms because they weren't getting the same textbooks. Mm -hmm. They weren't getting the same, and exactly. they, were, they were getting, mm -hmm. you know, the hand, still the hand me down. The hand me down. The Caucasian students. Mm -hmm. And um, so. You know, they're, 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 I think many parts of Texas, they realize there's a strength and unity in all of these people who are are considered minority to gather and to, to support each other. 
Yet they each have their own agenda. We can't, we can't, we can't be ignorant of that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it's things like these in the library where we get a dialogue, where we share ideas, where we fortify each other mm -hmm. instead of compete for, for the, the resources. I'm trying. <laughs> it's a learning process because I come from an area that's dictated by a black white binary, right? So this was my first, I lived in Houston for a while, but even then, you know, but this is my first time having to deal with kind of like it's, you know, black, white, and brown, and how has that story unfolded and how has it been the same? How has it been different? So it's been a really a learning experience. But thank you. So I will say this San Antonio did have a kind of a Mm -hmm. you might, like just like you said, mm -hmm. San Antonio had its problems. Jowski's the lunch counter. You're not gonna sit yes. here. Mm -hmm. HL Green, <laughs> no, 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 you're not gonna sit here. The whole bus thing. Uh, <laughs> they wanted to bring, and we have to thank the Reverend Block Black for this one. Get the story right. Yes. In the 1950s, they tried to bring Langston Hughes to San Antonio, and the city fathers said no. You're not bringing like We're just not gonna let you. They appeal. They could, I mean, how are you gonna tell us we can't bring in a speaker? <laughs> well, they show that. No, you're not bringing like you in. Lex and Hughes will, will, will uh, communist. No, we're not gonna let you in. That was the end of that. Mm -hmm. They shut that down. But that was how it was in San Antonio. It wasn't the best stress religion, it wasn't the city, mm -hmm. it crazy things would jump mm -hmm. on. And in East Texas, it was crazy, it, it was even worse. Yes. So, that's our history. That is, so Claude Black was one, was one of those allies of Martin Luther King, and it would behoove you if you want to know more about what went on in the 60s, uh, uh, the black community, the east side, north side, how we existed, how, you know, what battles were fought. I would read up anything. I, you can say my own some of the archives of the San Antonio Register, mm -hmm. where you will read a lot mm -hmm. of things that were going on at the time. What was happening with the, the segregated high school, which was Phyllis Wheatley, or mm -hmm. a St. Mm -hmm. Louis College, that was, that was the segregated college you went to. So it, it, it's quite an interesting history, and it's certainly, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to go into it very deeply, but there is a lot there. So we can enjoy your research. And, the, and the, the Claude Black papers too, like recently became available at Trinity. I'm like so excited about that. Oh, like his yeah. papers are, um, I mean, they're still working through them and getting them cataloged, but you can like see access them to a certain, to a limited extent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go, okay. Well, um, I want to make a little comment on the road, kind of. Well, um, San Antonio was the first place to be Wouldn't it be boring? <laughs> yeah, it would be really boring. Yeah. And there would be no fun. Right. <laughs> and okay. And you're right, they're very definitely punching themselves because my idol, Fannie Lou Hamer, is known for saying, nobody's free till everybody's free. So as long exactly. as, you know, we're mistreating people or seeing people be mistreated and our freedom is not guaranteed, right? Good. And that's why the struggle continues it continues and our kids need to understand that, that you know, we're headed out of here and we need to pass the torch. We need, we need the kids to understand that you need to take this torch and carry it further because it's not over. And that, so that's very important. And maybe one last question.
Work in San Antonio, working right alongside with Dr. Adams, you can pull And talking about the fathers of the city, who we had a lot here in the black community, Clark Black and Eugene Coleman were some of the fathers in the black community. And there are very few of them left. And Eugene Coleman is still here, fully in his right mind. And he's in his middle 90s now. And he's still every bit of an activist now, quietly, so that people don't forget, even now, because I work with him to study education. So I want you, as a university, we are looking at those papers from Clark Black. If you want to know more about Clark Black and some things, you know, yes, definitely. Right side with them, uh, contact with you. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Very good. We were hoping that this project would get off the ground here. That's still being worked on. Who knows? But see, we know if somebody's in the mid 90s, that's a treasure and a resource right there. That's we right. That's good. right. <laughs> that is so right. So many, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So we'd like to thank our um, panelists again, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if um, the library personnel have like anything you want to. Okay. As a gesture of appreciation, uh, the the San Antonio Public Library Foundation allowed me to buy some books for you guys to say thank you oh, um, wow. as a gift oh, for wow. speaking for us today. Thank you. What kind of library would I be if I didn't give oh, you a book? Right. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I really hope that you enjoyed today's information and that uh, you enjoyed today's program. Again, the videos are available on YouTube, which you can use our Wi-Fi to access. Uh, it also is available uh, on DVD for you to borrow with your own library card. If you'd like to learn more about the uh, African American experience in the United States, we certainly have many books and other materials that are available in our public libraries. One last thing, please fill out the survey. We need to know your input and, and understand some of the, the comments that you would like to, to leave with us to develop and bring to you better and bigger programs. Um, again, this program was made available by the San Antonio Public Library Foundation and the National NEH, the National Endowment Education for the, Endowment, of, for the Endowment for Humanities. Humanities, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, through their, through their uh, created equal uh, uh, arts grants. So thank you very much, and please make sure to see Gamini uh, to, with the survey. And please feel, feel free to, to have some more refreshments. There's plenty of uh, food yeah. still there. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Is it okay to grab Yes, that is so cool. Thank you both again. Right. I, I enjoyed you both.